Today the title of the message is um, When God Says No. Do me a favor, Maddie, make sure that door is closed down there. All righty? Okay. Not that I don't love the sounds of children. Oh, I don't know about that sound. <laughs> when God says no, and that might get you nervous and uh, feeling a little bit down, but you'll find out the good side of that today when God says no. 2 Corinthians 12, and I know we have listed probably 1 through, well, actually, actually it is 1 through 10. Alan must be walking in the Spirit because that's what I wanted to read, was 1 through 10, not 1 through 12. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 10, the Apostle Paul, we believe, to be speaking and inspired of God here as he addresses the church at Corinth. It says, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise, and heard inexpressible words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for your word today. And we acknowledge it, we accept it as being the supernatural word of God that changes us. We know that it's more than simply words on a page, but it's the words of our Savior, the Word of God Himself. And we pray today, Lord God, as we listen, as You've promised, we pray that faith would come by the hearing of Your Word. Thank You that Your Word will not return void. And Father, we will not allow that to happen as we listen intently to what You have to say to our hearts. We pray you would receive glory in everything we do, in the preaching, in the listening, in the evaluating, the decisions we make or don't make. Might they bring glory to you. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. You can be seated, folks. <clears throat> Has God ever said no to you? Have you ever prayed for something a long time and you just kind of assumed that it was a no? Maybe you hoped it was a not yet and that it was still coming, certainly as we pray for the souls and the eternal destiny of loved ones around us, we always pray that it's not yet and that they would come to know Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. What do we do when even our prayers and our pleading and our begging with God and we come to the end of that and it seems like heaven is silent? If you're like me, I love stories of answered prayers. You know, you get ready to preach a message on prayer and you 
try to think of some real life situations. Some people open up a book of a thousand illustrations. I've never been one of those guys because the Lord usually does something in my life the same week of my sermon that it's a real life illustration usually. But I love to hear stories about answered prayer, great deliverances, miracles, interventions. It always seems to do something for my own faith when I see God working in the life of others. Sometimes it encourages us to pray more. Sometimes it brings greater confidence into our life and boldness and detail as we come before God's throne of grace. We suddenly become amazed and we believe that God has to answer. God has to give me direction in this circumstance. Sometimes we make the mistake that we dictate the timing to Him. We dictate the outcome. We dictate the circumstances. We dictate all of the details that need to transpire in order for His will to be accomplished in our life. When really He is in charge of all those things, and God doesn't necessarily have to say yes to our requests because He is a faithful Creator. And He can take the good, the bad, I know you knew I'd say, and the ugly. He can take the positive, the negative, the adverse circumstances, the blessings, and mold them all together for the perfect answer and the perfect time. And most of the time, even as believers, we say, I just can't believe it. I never saw that coming. God is so good. And God, I'm sure, kind of looks at us and says, I had the answer all along. It never changed. And I knew what I was going to do, so why don't you just commit the next battle to me? And let me fight the war. And you just come along for the ride. And I mean that with all my heart, because we all battle. We all have doubts and inconsistencies, so we need that in our life. God is not in a place where He has to say yes. I remember watching one of my favorite Christmas movies. Maybe it's one of your favorites also. It's with Tim Allen. And it was called The Santa Claus. And this seems like something, if there really was a Santa Claus, it would have happened to me. But Santa Claus is on Tim's roof. And Santa Claus slips, falls off, and dies. What a dreadful story for children. You know? He falls off of the roof, and somehow Santa's coat is suddenly on Tim Allen. And I guess he is put in the place where he is now going to be the new Santa. He wants no part of it. He starts to gain weight, like overnight. He's a slender guy and suddenly, you know, the stomach is way out here. Suddenly he can grow a beard overnight. And he shaves it frantically in the morning, but when he looks back five minutes later into the mirror, it goes... And there he is, he's got a full beard again. He just wants no part of it, but finally he accepts it. And when he is the Santa Claus... He has some dealings with his child, his son, and also with his ex-wife and her new husband. And finally, when they kind of acknowledge that he is Santa Claus, he wonders why they don't believe in Santa. And they tell him the truth of the matter, why they reject Santa. When they were children, the ex-wife asked for a special doll that she never received. And her husband prayed for a weenie whistle. (laughs) Tells you something about him. That he never received. And they said, when we didn't get what we asked Santa for, we stopped believing. We put Santa into the background. He just became an afterthought. We no longer believed in Santa. And unfortunately, as silly as that sounds, I think we do that as Christians with God. I think many times 
when God does not answer us according to what we think is best, using the details that we would like to see be used in our life, we many times put God on the back burner. And we say to ourselves, apparently He doesn't care, apparently He doesn't know, apparently He is not listening, and we don't go to Him or believe in Him the way that we used to. Does He care? Is He real? Does He even exist that I do something wrong? Even Romans 8.26, I mention it so often, says we don't even know how to pray. We don't know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit of God who lives within helps our infirmities that we would learn to pray according to the will of God. And we know when we pray according to the will of God, those prayers are answered. But if it is according to the Spirit of God, He probably is not going to have us pray for something that we're not going to receive. Or He's going to bring to mind what is the best way to pray and what are the proper words to use, and more importantly, what the proper Spirit is behind the words that we give to Almighty God. I want to lift up some things to you this morning that I hope will help you because probably you pray. Maybe not as fervently as we should. Maybe it's a quick conversation sometimes. Maybe we throw up a prayer here and there to God. Maybe we're more fervent in our prayers when we're in trouble or when things heat up. And I think that's true for all of us. Probably some of my most fervent prayers, the ones I cry out, the ones where my eyes well up and I'm scared to death is when I'm in adversity or I'm in trouble. But I think God wants to teach us to pray with the same fervency and the same desire and the same expectation whenever we're praying. So we're going to look at a few things. And point number one is treat trials as a gift from God given to you. If you look at 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, and I believe it to be Paul, but I believe the newfounded humility that he has received from God, he is not going to claim that he is the one being written about. He says, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. So, I think you know the story. Probably, and this is a little bit of speculation, probably Paul, maybe when he was stoned, rocks were thrown at him at Lystra, and he was dragged from the city, he was probably dead. And this might have been the time where God called him up into the third heaven, where God abides to speak things to him, to show him things that were just wonderfully amazing so that he would be encouraged because God was not finished with him yet in this world. You know, Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die gain. I'm sure he wanted to stay in heaven. Who in the world would want to come back into this world if we experienced heaven? But while he was there, all of the great things that he saw, he says that he was given a thorn in the flesh. A minister of Satan came along to buffet him. And you might say, how did Satan get into the act? How could Satan do something so devious and diabolical while God's blessing him with all these things that he's seeing and hearing? Well, understand... He was given this thorn in the flesh, so we have to consider it was a gift. Now, you've all received gifts that you did not want. <laughs> you have all received gifts that you just as soon take it back, even though you said, oh, thank you. Well, this was a gift because anything that would happen to the man of God, the Apostle Paul, had to be okayed by God. Had to be allowed by God. And it was part of the package for God making Paul into the servant that God wanted Paul 
to be. Now, Paul said, I do not want this gift. Take it back, please. And he pleaded three times. And I wish we would understand, I don't know if you'd ever study it out, when he asked three times, it wasn't him just throwing up, please, please, please. It was much more fervent than that. As he sought out the Lord and asked for this thorn to be removed, and God said, no, no, no. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And after the third time, Paul got it, decided to accept it, actually decided to embrace it so that he could become a better servant for God. So technically, we have to realize that God said no to the Apostle Paul. So, first off, treat trials as a gift from God given to you when you receive a no. The book of James, the first chapter, says that we should pray for wisdom. We should pray for faith and not always pray for deliverance like the children's workers are praying for right now. We should not pray for deliverance. We should say, Lord, what is happening? How do I grow by this? What can I learn? How can my faith be increased? When this takes place, growth occurs. Growth occurs when this is our attitude. And certainly one of our motivations for prayer during hard times. Come on, we pray when we're hurting. We pray when we're confused. We pray when there is difficult times, but receive trials as a gift from God. So don't view it as God said no, like we do so often. God didn't really say no. He said no to your request and my request, but He gave us what was best. James 1.2 says, My brethren, count it all joy. When ye fall into divers temptations, knowing that by these you gain endurance. So even when it seems like a no, God is doing something powerful to teach us so that we might grow. Because a lot of times when we get no's from God, you know what we do? We start ignoring the things that we prayed about. We put them on the back burner. We refuse to even acknowledge their existence anymore. Lord, help me with that guy at work. And that guy doesn't change. And nothing changes. And the circumstances don't change. So we say, well, I just won't look at him anymore. I just won't. If I see him at the water cooler, at the coffee thing, I'm not going there anymore. I just won't talk to him. Because my prayer wasn't answered. His heart has not changed. And that is not what God is saying when He tells us that sometimes He says, no, we love ignoring problems, but do they go away? I wrote down a couple of things. Ignore the noise in your car. Turn up the radio. You know, clunk, 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 clunk. Turn up the radio. Put on your favorite song. I'm sure that'll repair your car. The numbness in your left arm. Ignore it. It doesn't exist. It's not real. It'll go away. When your bills come in, throw them in the bill drawer and shut the drawer. They'll go away. There won't be any problems. Everything will be fine. You know the bills I hate even when I have the money to pay them? Medical stuff. Co-pays. You know, I get angry when I see them. And Karen knows. And she's like, what's this? You know, and everything is paid, but there'll be some co-pays and some medical bills. And sometimes they can be ten bucks. And I'm like, Phew. <laughs> And I throw it in the draw. It's like, I don't want to look at that stupid thing, them taking my money and I'm still sick. Are you kidding? Just ignore it. You'll never be in any trouble. It won't hurt your credit. Everything is fine. You'll never see a collection agency. 
They ignore it. Well, we do that. God says no, and we suddenly ignore the things that we have been praying for, and we start to embrace our problems rather than find out why God said no. Now listen carefully. There was a man in the Bible. You know the story. He lay at a special pool at a place called Solomon's Porch. He lay there for 38 years. And the story was that one time a year, if you could get into the pool quicker than anybody else, an angel would come and stir up the water, and the person who would get into the water first would be healed of their infirmity. This guy who had laid around for 38 years, when he was a younger man and first deposited at the pool, he probably had friends there to try to help get him in the water. He probably had family members who had brought him and deposited him there, and they probably tried to get him in the water first. Even if he couldn't walk, and he couldn't, he was lame, he probably tried to drag himself with his arms. He probably ended up with big muscles just dragging himself as fast as he could along the ground trying to get into the pool. But as he got older and older and older and more despondent and more depressed and I can't get in the water and God's not going to help me, he started to stroke his story. Even when Jesus came up and He said, what is it that you want from Me? He said, oh, I've been here 38 years. Everyone knows. Everyone knows my story. God has apparently said no to me. God has rejected me. I tried years ago to get in, but everyone always beat me into the water first. And this is my life. This is my sorrow. This is my calamity. Share in my grief. I meet people like that all the time. God says no, but He wants to build you through the infirmity. He wants to build you through the hardship. He wants to make you into a man or a woman of God through the circumstances He left you in, but we create a video. And anybody that will listen will hear about our sorrow. Corey, yesterday, I was trying to witness and invite some people, you know, not to offend anybody, but I figured the vendors, vendors were going to stay anyway for the most part. So one particular vendor, I was just sitting here on the step and we were talking, and she said something that made me feel bad for her. And I said, you know, you ought to... Come out to church sometime. It's at 11 o'clock. I said, some of the things we talk about might be of some help to you. And she went, I, you know, I wish I could get her exact facial expression. But she went, you know, like you poor dumb guy. Apparently, you don't know what I've been through. And she said to me, she went through a series of things. She said, I could never come. Do you know my life? Do you know what I go through physically? Do you know what I go through emotionally? Do you know my responsibilities? Do you know where I'm going after here? And to get the energy to suddenly show up and be sitting in a church? And I felt like I was viewing the video. She had learned how to tell her story. And she needed God. She needed Christ. She needed her energy to be spent finding out, maybe not answers to everything as she would perceive it, but what can God do in my life, in my circumstances, by His grace? Everybody here could come up with a story, could you not? As to why you couldn't serve God, why you can't be in church, why you can't open His Word, why you can't believe that He'll answer your prayer, or build you up in Him when He chooses not to? Everybody has a story. Do you have a story? You can submit it. <laughs> and we'll put it on the overhead. And we'll have a contest and see which story is the most moving and emotional. I'm a very emotional guy. I can come up with some stuff. So you will have some competition if we ever turn this into a competition. So, treat trials as a gift from God. 
What is He going to teach me through this? Not, He said no. And I'm just going to put my whole life on the back burner now and I'm just going to ignore the things I prayed for. Why don't you say, Lord, you apparently you said no right now and you're building a servant to be more like the Savior. And I'm going to embrace that. I'm going to pray for wisdom. I'm going to pray for faith. I don't know why all these things happen, but it's not up to me to know. Who in the world am I? I pray all the time. Lord, I'm just a weak little man. You ever pray, Lord, make me smarter than I am because I'm not all that bright? I mean for yourself, not me. (laughs) Maybe you pray that for me too. I don't know. But I pray that all the time. Lord, we're just weak little men and women. We don't know what we're doing. We think we know what we're going to do in a half an hour. Maybe you have an eating place picked out. Maybe you're going for a buffet. Maybe you're going to the park. I don't know. Maybe it's the day to clean the house. Maybe you're going to just lay and watch a ball game. How do we know? How do we know what's going to take place ten minutes from right now? We think we know. We think we perceive. But God is the one who is in control. Secondly, remember what God has already done. What He's already said and done. How many times does Paul over and over again in the Word of God give his testimony and he says over and over again, I am what I am by the grace of God. I'm the chief of sinners. I'm a Pharisee. I'm the son of a Pharisee. I sat at the feet of a doctor of the law, Gamaliel. I'm wretched before my perfect Lord and Savior. Listen, Paul remembered what God had done. And maybe it helped Paul when the nose came along. When you have some hard times and difficulties and God says, no, I'm going to leave you right there right now for this purpose, maybe it will help us to remember what He's already done. I pray all the time, Lord, if You only died for me on the cross, it's enough. It's enough to know I have an eternity with You. And that the sinless Son of God died for me on my behalf. I love this part of the song. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. Amen? And that's the way I think we need to be. Perhaps when Paul was shipwrecked, when he had rocks thrown at him, when he had various deceptions and people were no longer his friends, the deceit, the betrayal, the imprisonments. Maybe what God had already done touched his heart and kept him strong and allowed him to receive an apparent no and embrace the circumstances that he was set down in. Remember when Paul was on the road to Damascus to go kill and imprison more Christians? And he got knocked down off of his donkey onto the ground Acts 9 6 says, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Jesus said, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. What was the first thing that happened to Paul when he got knocked off of the donkey? He was blinded. He lay on the ground blind. They had to take him by the hands, this proud guy and lead him in to the city. Now, I don't seem to remember at 18 years of age when I received Christ as Savior being blinded. Can you imagine when you received Christ if suddenly you fell to the ground and you couldn't walk? If when you said, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior, suddenly you couldn't hear anybody? Or you couldn't see anybody? Can you imagine? If when you said, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior, immediately you had cancer? Immediately you had some life-threatening disease? Paul does the most wonderful thing that we could possibly do. We embrace it emotionally. I got saved. And he's blinded. And he's led into the city... And he meets with a disciple named Ananias on a street called Straight. Isn't God cool? 
And Ananias says to God, apparently you don't know who this guy is, Lord. This is Saul of Tarsus. He persecutes guys like me. And you want me to embrace him and take him into my home and help him out? God says in today's language, don't worry about it. (laughs) I'm all set. I know what I'm doing. He is a chosen vessel unto me who shall suffer many things. If I ever heard that about my life, I think I would unenlist. If when I said, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior, good, because you're going to suffer many things. (laughs) Excuse me? Imagine, you know, you, you talk about trying to grow in a church. You know, should we tell people that as they come in? Receive Christ because you're going to suffer many things. Oh, amen. I'll do it. Sign me up. Right? No, I don't think so. Sowing and reaping. Everything he had done in persecuting the church of God, we find that he says to Ananias, he's a chosen vessel. He will suffer many things. Paul knew that. And he embraced that. And yet even later on, in serving the Lord with a fervency, he's given a thorn in the flesh and he asks deliverance. And God says no three times. Listen, when we received Christ, did you bring some baggage into your new Christian life? Do you still suffer for some stuff? Do you still pay for some wrong decisions you made before you came to God? I do. Every single day, my nose is kind of lovingly rubbed in it. This is what sin does. This is why you need grace. This is why you need to help others. Right? Every single day. The third thing, don't stop praying. Continue praying to God. Look at verse 8. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. It wasn't quick. It wasn't a superficial, shallow prayer. It was deep. It was passionate. He was begging with God that this thorn, this problem, could be removed. I wrote down a couple of examples. I hope you'll take those bulletins. I will sound like a broken record, even though... uh, Younger people don't know what a broken record is. We used to have, what well, you know, 45 records and they skipped. And we'd hear the same song a million times or the same line a million times. And we'd have to run to the other room and go, you know, so that it would, it would move on. I might sound like a broken record, but take notes. Go home and review what we talked about because God will say no sometimes and not yet sometimes. And we have to embrace some circumstances sometimes without giving up and putting things on the back burner. He pleaded. It was passionate. It was persistent. Some examples in the Word of God. Mark, the fifth chapter, verse 23. Jairus, who was a ruler in the temple, had a young daughter who was near death. And Jairus begs with Jesus to heal his daughter. Can you imagine if your child is dying, how do you pray? Especially when you're looking at the one who claims to be the Son of God. How do you pray? Do you beg? Do you plead? Is it passionate? And then Mark 1 and verse 40, the man with leprosy looks at Christ and he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can heal me. Must have been pretty cool when Jesus looked at him and said, I'm willing. And he healed him. But passionately he asked for a healing. What about Matthew 18, 19? Remember the person who owed the great debt to his master and he was getting ready to deliver him to the tormentors? Would anybody here like to be delivered to the tormentors? That sounds like a science fiction flick. Doesn't it? Oh yes, please deliver me to the tormentors. That's my choice. I don't think so. He was going to be delivered to the tormentors and this guy fell on his face and he said, I will pay you all. Please don't do this to me. He couldn't pay at all. It was millions and millions and millions of dollars by today's standards. He could never hope to pay it. But his master 
forgave him. Can you imagine how he was begging as he looked at the dungeon and he saw other people being dragged away? Can you imagine how you would plead and beg to the Lord? Great passion. When God says no, don't stop praying. Do I have my little acrostic up there? Yes, I do. Push. P-U-S-H. Pray till something happens. Just keep praying. Just keep praying until something happens. I'm not all-knowing. If I don't know the mind of God, all I know how to do is to keep on praying. Maybe God will change the direction. Maybe God will change the choices. But God is pleased when we talk to Him. So let's just keep praying. I had a person years ago tell me they were a master prayer warrior. And they had no difficulty with pride. (laughs) You ever meet up with a master prayer warrior? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I've met some, but they don't tell you that that's what they are. Master prayer warrior. Listen, I don't know all the time what God wants to do. But I know He's faithful. I know He's honest. I know He's all-powerful. So I am going to keep praying to Him until something happens. Fourth, listen for God's voice. 2 Corinthians 12, the first part of verse 9, says, And He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So God did answer, didn't He? He did get an answer. He says, You've got my grace. You've got to know in this situation in your prayer request, but you got my grace. Following the 9-11 tragedies at the Twin Towers, they brought in listening devices into the rubble. These listening devices were so sophisticated, they could hear even a heart beating. They could hear a small child whimpering on these listening devices, but even so, all the distractions muffled out the sound of what might have been life. I want to ask you a question today. What distractions do you have in your life that perhaps keep you from being able to listen for the still, small voice of God? Maybe a relationship. Maybe a weight or a sin as described in the Word of God. Maybe an addiction. And you know what? We all got stuff. That's why we like to preach grace. We all have backgrounds and problems and things that God wants to forgive us for. But what is blocking out the voice of God so that we cannot hear Him? The final and the fifth thing this morning. Trust in God's power. Also in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 12, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So the weaker we are, the stronger we are in Almighty God because He's a faithful Creator. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Paul said to know Him and the power of His resurrection. Remember where the Greek word for power? Dunamis. We get our English word dynamite. So we want the dynamite of God in our life. So, final thought, folks. Serve God right where you are. Verse 10 says, Therefore, remember my old Bible college professor said to me, Son, when you see therefore, you've got to see what it's there for. That was deep. It's very deep. Still stays with me today. So much longer. Therefore, I take pleasure. You've got to be kidding in infirmities, in reproaches, in distresses for Christ's sake. There's the key. For Christ's sake. Not for your sake. Not for my sake. To enhance the kingdom. To help other people. We're not home yet. It's not just about, I wish everything could just go well. I just wish I'd never have problems. I just wish I could pay every bill. I just wish there'd be no pain in my body ever. For Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I've heard a lot of no's to my prayer requests. I'm sure there's a lot of not yet. There have been a lot of yeses. 
thank God, enjoy them, glorify in them, get excited about them. But understand, God is making us into soldiers. We're not home yet. Does that mean we're not to have a good time? We're not to be happy. We're not to enjoy relationships. I think we can be in the midst of the storm and have a good life, a joyful life, and enjoy some of the best things. Even though this creation is marred, God's still a great God. And there's a lot of beauty. There's a lot of sweetness. There's a lot of wonderful things. I work at Taunton State Hospital, and when I see the light bulb go on on Thursday night when I do my service, one guy said, I want to be like Jabez. I want my coast enhanced. I want to take new land and property. Life's got to be beyond this place. I say, thank God. Thank God. When I see people in our church grow and the light bulb goes on, I say, thank God. It's so good. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Heads bowed and eyes closed. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm a little hard of hearing. I hear chimes and buzzers and whistles and kids crying all around me, but concentrate on the Word of God this morning. The still small voice. It's funny I talked about distractions when the listening devices were implanted. Try to listen. Try to listen to what God's trying to say to your heart today. When God says no, Paul was a prayer warrior. God said no. Three times. So Paul showed us he's human. Once should have been enough, but he kept praying. Sometimes we don't get it right away. Maybe you're here today and you might say, I'm praying for some things and I'm broken hearted. I haven't seen them yet. Pastor, I want to pray for faith. I want to pray for wisdom. I want to know God's mind on the situation I'm going through. I don't want to put God on the back burner or as an afterthought thought, or ignore my circumstances. One step at a time, I want to be outfitted for heaven. Pray for me this morning. Anybody like that today? Hands all over. Amen. Amen. I cannot promise you a perfect world. You'll be disillusioned very quickly. And you know that. But to speak the truth in love, and to let people know they have a strong Savior they can lean on, who will bring them through, who has a plan, who will instill confidence in you, and work all things out for His good and His pleasure, that'll encourage you. And that's what we need to do. I have a need in my life right now, Pastor, and by my uplifted hand, please keep me in prayer. I'm going through something really rough. Pray for me. Anybody like that today? I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand. Anybody else? Pray for me today. I'm going through something rough. It's rough for you. Pray for me. Father, we really do thank you that we are not know-it-alls, but we can check in with the one who knows it all. And that's you. We can't work anything out on our own, Lord. Joshua was simply told to remove his sandals when he inquired of the angel of the Lord who would battle at Jericho. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. We don't know where to go. We don't know how everything will turn out. And that bothers us. We like to play a part, a role. We like to control. Forgive us. Help us to take off our sandals, spiritually speaking, and realize we're on holy ground and trust you and serve you. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.